Okay, we're back for uh, message two in this series in the book of Revelation. Uh, if you're with us last week, you'll know that I kind of shared that the book of Revelation is in sort of three um, time periods, the past, the present, the future. Uh, according to Revelation 1 verse 19, where Jesus told John to write the things which you have seen. That was chapter one. The things which are, that's going to be chapter two and three, will be there for the next seven weeks. It's the church age. We're going to look at the seven churches of Revelation. Um, and that's that's the present. And the things which will take place after this, which is the bulk of the book, chapters four to 22. So we'll get into all of it at one point or another this year, unless Jesus comes. Uh, so we're going to start with the church age thing for the next seven weeks. We're going to be looking at the seven churches of Revelation there were more than seven churches, you know, in the world at that time, in the in the inhabited Roman world. Why the number seven? Because seven is the number of completion. You'll see this number seven popping up throughout the book of Revelation. You know, seven angels, um, seven golden lampstands, seven stars, um, seven plagues, uh, you know, the sevenfold spirit of, of God. Seven is the number of completion. And this book, Revelation, is the last book written in our canon of scripture of the 27 books of the New Testament, the 66 books of the whole Bible. It's the last one. It completes the canon of scripture. So this whole idea of completion uh, is a theme. Of course, it's throughout the book. I told you last week that the uh, book of Revelation is all about Jesus 55 overt references to Jesus in the 22 chapters. If you didn't catch last week's message, you can go back online and catch yourself up. You'll need to do that because uh, I kind of set the table for the rest of it. We're going to dig in this week, though, starting with the first of the seven churches, which is the church of Ephesus. So let's pray and then we'll see what God has for us today. Father, we're so thankful that these messages were given to John by revelation. Jesus revealed the things about the church to him to share with the churches and not just the churches at that time when John was writing at the end of the first century, but here, right here, uh, uh, close to the beginning of the 21st century. So Father, we have a message we need to hear from the Holy Spirit today. I pray, Lord, that you speak to our hearts, have our hearts tuned to what you are saying to us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. The church at Ephesus, why is Ephesus the first of the seven churches uh, written? Well, the island of Patmos was in the Aegean Sea off the coast of Turkey there, and Ephesus is the closest one. Maybe that was why, I don't know. There's kind of a circuit that John's going to go in here. Maybe he just did that because it was a logical order. I don't know. But the seven churches have attributes, uh, good and bad, that apply to the church today. This is this is why this is a now message. This isn't just something we look at historically. This church did exist. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, there is a focus to this passage, and we'll get to that as well. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things, says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you, have, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. There's a ton in this passage. What do we know about Ephesus? Okay, so Ephesus was a leading city in the Roman Empire. It was the fourth largest city at that time behind Rome, Alexandria, Antioch, and then Ephesus. It was a very important city. It was a port city. It was on the Aegean Sea coast there. Um, population of about 225,000 to 250,000, so a very prominent city. Um, busy port with a harbor there. Um, a lot of cultural arts things, political things. It was very busy that way. It also had a, a large theater, about uh, seated about 24 or 25,000. If you go back in the New Testament, the book of uh, Acts, when Paul planted the church of Ephesus, you know there was a big riot that occurred there and it was all happening in the theater. So it was a very large theater there. Um, 
also the probably the most prominent thing in the whole city of Ephesus, what it was really known for was the temple to the fertility goddess Artemis. That's what the Greeks called her, the, the Romans called her Diana, which is a Latin derivation there. So the Diana or Artemis, who is a multi-breasted goddess and the daughter of Zeus, according to Greek mythology. And uh, it was believed that her image had fallen from, from the heavens uh, and landed there. And so they built this this temple and, and there was shrines that were made for her. This is all in the book of Acts as well. So it was a, a fertility cult. There was a lot of prostitution, a lot of sexual immorality, uh, rampant that was associated with the goddess uh, Diana or Artemis. She was a multi-breasted goddess. And, and so there was just a, it was an awful city that way morally, but Paul, the apostle Paul had planted the church there and there was a thriving church there. And that's the one that Jesus is addressing to John. Um, John, after his exile on the island of Patmos, later went to Ephesus. So, you know, in the New Testament, Paul planted the church. Timothy, uh, Paul's uh, sidekick, became the pastor there. Um, church history tradition uh, says that Timothy was martyred towards the end of the first century. And then Apollos uh, was pastoring there. Priscilla and Aquila for a time oversaw the church. But then John, when his exile in Patmos uh, was complete, he ended up going to Ephesus and pastored there, and he ended up writing the Gospel of John there, probably the Epistles of John as well, and then his, his grave is there in Ephesus as well. Um, a little tidbit here. Guess who one of the most famous members of the Ephesus church was? Why, it was Mary, the mother of Jesus. You'll recall at the foot of Jesus that um, Jesus said to, to John, behold your mother, and to his mother, behold your son. And John took her uh, into his care from that point on. So she was there. He was the pastor of the church. So she was a member of the Ephesus church. But I wouldn't want to be the pastor trying to preach sermons um, with Mary in the front row thinking, man, my son could out preach you. Like, oh, well, anyway, not sure that's how she, she did it. But uh, the point is, this was a very prominent city. A very busy church was in this city as well. This, this uh, church at Ephesus, very, very prominent. Um, I want to read something to you here. In the book of Acts, Paul, his last words to the elders in Ephesus was a warning. Acts 20, I'm not going to read the whole portion. Uh, it's worth it for you to read from 17 to the end of the chapter, but I'll pick up at verse 29. Uh, I'll start at verse 28 and to go to verse 30 of Acts 20. This is what the Apostle Paul said to the elders of the Ephesian church. Now, this is some 60 years earlier, okay? He said this, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. A warning there. Some from an out would come in, false apostles, false prophets, giving a false message, okay? Not commissioned by Jesus. But then, even more subtle, those from within their own ranks would rise up and also lead the people into error. So he warned them, look, this is going to happen. You better be on your, on your guard about this. And to the church's credit, they took the Apostle Paul's words very seriously. Look at some of the resume that Jesus acknowledges for us in this uh, words to John. He says to the, about the church, he says, I know your works, your labor, your patience. By the way, the word for labor there is like back-breaking, exhausting labor, wearisome, bone-weary type labor. These people worked hard at serving God and being a witness in this community. This is a really good, this is a really good resume here, actually at least up to this point. I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil. See, so they took the Apostle Paul's words very seriously. You have tested those who say they're apostles and are not and have found them liars. You have persevered. You have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. So, so far, so good. I mean, boy, this is really good. If, if you had to find a church to go to, man, you want to go to this church. This is a busy, happening church. They're they're championing the cause of pure doctrine, uh, not wanting to get people in error. They want to make sure they stay in the straight path. This is all really good stuff. But I know it's coming. B-U-T. But 
Oh, if only verse four wasn't in there. Verse four, nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. What does that mean? Let me read you a quote. Excellent book here called The Sacred Chase. Uh, the subtitle is Moving from Proximity to Intimacy with God. It's written by a fellow by the name of Heath Adamson. And what's interesting about Adamson's point in this book is that church busyness, doing things, it's, it's a good thing, okay, in and of itself, but it can be an insulator to intimacy. So proximity, being around God and the things of God can actually be a thing that insulates us from actually being with God, having intimacy with God. This is incredible quote from the book, The Jesus Way, written by the late Eugene Peterson, which Adamson quotes, religion is one of the best covers for sin of almost all kinds. Pride, anger, lust, and greed are vermin that flourish under the floorboards of religion. Wow. Those of us who are identified with institutions or vocations in religion can't be too vigilant. The devil does some of his best work behind stained glass. You know, what is, what is Peterson saying there? He's saying a lot of this busyness and religious work, good works, stuff, it, it, it's good. But we can be so caught up in that that we miss what we really need the most, which is a closeness in our walk with God and intimacy. Intimacy is a scary thing because when you're intimate with someone, you're vulnerable. They know what most people don't know. They get behind closed doors. Um, you know, a marriage, you can see somebody walking in public, a couple think, wow, they got a fantastic marriage. I know because I've been a pastor for many years. I've counseled people. I've had people sit in my counseling office and I, on the outside, it looked like they had a really great marriage until you find out what was happening behind closed doors, stuff that other people didn't see. There was a lack of intimacy. I remember I counseled a couple a number of years ago, and at the time, they'd been married over 30 years. And they had a great marriage. If you saw them, thought, wow, they're involved in the church, everything else like that. But for years, they'd been sleeping in separate beds and separate bedrooms. They hadn't had sexual relations in years. On the outside, it looked like they had a great marriage. They just said, you know, we just, we're very different. We just keep to ourselves. We don't get in each other's way and it, you know, it all works out. That's not a marriage. Okay. So God's saying, I, he, Jesus commending this church for their great works, like their perseverance and, and championing the cause of, of pure doctrine. But he says, but you're, you're missing something and, and what you're missing trumps all those other things. It's the thing you can't live without your first love, the freshness, the the intimacy with God. Um, let's take a look at some other verses here. Um, Jesus said something in Matthew 22. Actually, uh, he had said in, in Matthew 24, verse 12, because lawlessness is increasing, sin and this type of thing, which is what's happening in our world. But he said this in the first century. He says, because lawlessness is increasing, the love of many will grow cold. Boy, that's a dangerous place to be when your love grows cold. Jesus was once confronted by a religious ruler about what was the greatest commandment. He didn't say, he could have listed any of the Ten Commandments and said, do this, do this, do this, whatever, all of the above. But that's not what he said. It's recorded for us in Matthew 22, starting at verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, religious leader, asked him a question, testing him saying, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? What's the top commandment? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Some versions say first and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Interesting, he said, you've left your first love. So in one sense, because they were championing the cause for righteousness and protecting their members, you know, uh, you'd say that they had a love for their members, but there was a lack there. And, and, and I would put it in the order of that Jesus put it in. You got to love God first. And when you're loving God first, you'll be able to love others. You know, First John 4, 19, also written by the same John, he said, we love because he first loved us. 
So my friends, if you don't get anything else I say today, you got to get this. We've got to get the temperature rising in our love for God. We've got to stoke the furnace of our passion for Jesus himself. If that is burning hot, it's going to overflow its banks and we're going to be able to love others properly in the way we should. But if we're not loving God, if he's not our first choice, if he's not first in our life, then those our love for others will also grow cold. Think about when you were dating your wife or dating your husband. You know, you I, I can remember I, I, I couldn't wait to hear from my wife on the phone when I was dating her. I couldn't wait to call her up. I was away at school and, and I just longed for a phone call, anything, any, you know, and I think after you get married for a few years, you take that for granted sometimes. You just sort of, she's there, yeah, whatever, and you get used to it. And there's a staleness, there's a, there's a, uh, you know, a casualness that comes in that, that, that permeates and can kind of steal the passion from a marriage. And it's so important for us in all, all, any of our relationships to keep the fire burning hot. God said, I'm, I'm grateful for all these good works you're doing. This church was doing a lot of great things in this city. They, they had a lot of influence, but their influence was waning, even though they were doing these good things, because their love for God, their passionate love for God was waning. Let's take a look at a few other verses here. In the Old Testament, in uh, the book of Jeremiah, uh, of course, Jeremiah, when he preached at a time when people of God were just turning to other idols. Now, these people weren't in Ephesus, weren't turning to other idols. They were, they were following God, but it was a Mary Martha thing. Remember Luke 10 verse 38 to 42 when Jesus came to the home of Mary and Martha. Remember the two sisters? They had a very approach to Jesus's visit that day. The older sister Martha wanted to make sure the meal was on, everything was cooked clean, everything was ready and prepared. She was fussing about but she was getting kind of flustered in her fussing because her younger sister Mary wasn't helping. Mary wanted to sit at the feet of Jesus and just listen to his every word and and Jesus commended Mary now, a lot of us Christians in the 21st century, we struggle with that. It's like, oh, um, are you sure? Um, I kind of would want the meal put on. God craves our presence. He wants us to be in love with him. You know, if you said to someone, I love so-and-so, like if you said in your marriage, I love you, but I'm not in love with you. How impressed would your spouse be with that? They wouldn't be impressed with that. There's a difference between saying, I love this person. And I'm in love with this person. Think about that. God, we would all say, I love God. I'm a follower of God. I go to church. I read my Bible. I pray. I, I love God. Yes, I don't disagree with you on that. But my second question is, are you in love with God? Look what Jeremiah 2, verse 2 and 3 say. Okay. Uh, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal, when you went after me in the wilderness, in a land not sown. Israel was holiness to the Lord, the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him will offend. Disaster will come upon them, says the Lord. God says, he told Jeremiah, I want you to tell these people, I remember the love of your youth. I, I remember when, you know, the kindness of your youth, the, the love of your betrothal, when you went after me. In the, I remember when you chased me, you stopped chasing me. You're, you're, you're not in love with me anymore. You know what happens when we aren't in love with someone? We still love them, so there's kind of a conviction, but we're, when we're not in love with them, we make other things up. We do other things to try to make up for it. That's exactly what Israel did. Verse 13, same chapter, Jeremiah 2. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Cistern was a held just stagnant water, which bugs and dead vermin could and foul it up and type of thing. It wasn't rushing, clean, moving, living water, fresh water. He says, that's what I was, but you forsook me. Isn't that what the Ephesians did? They left their first love. So they actually made a choice to not passionately pursue God. They said, yeah, I don't want to, I'm tired of the dating scene. I'm going to, I'll just do a bunch of things, good works. It's kind of like parents saying, I love my children, but I don't want to spend any time with them. I'll just buy them a bunch of expensive gifts at Christmas and their birthday. That'll make up for it. You know something, you're going to, kids might be blown away at an early age. 
initially with that. But over time, they're going to say, you know something? I remember I did a funeral a number of years ago for a man that did so much for his family. He worked hard. He's a workaholic. He worked so hard. Put them on expensive vacations, but didn't go on the vacations with them. Sent his wife and children on the va beautiful vacations, but he didn't go. He stayed home and worked. Bought them expensive gifts for their birthday and Christmas. He never spent time with them. And I remember the, the daughter said to me at the funeral, oh, you know, I, I'm not, I, I don't mean to sound ungrateful. My dad didn't, you know, because he bought all these things for us. But we just really wanted him to go with us on vacation. We didn't have to go to the most expensive place. I didn't have to have the best gifts of, for a birthday and Christmas. I just wanted my dad to be there. I wanted him to enjoy it with me. This is where God's at with us, my friend. Boy, there's a lot of verses we could look at. We are going to continue to look at a few more. Um, I want to read you a story first from Sacred Chase. Um, are you familiar with the painter Vincent Van Gogh? Very famous, right? It's got some very famous paintings. The author here says, My favorite painting in the world is called Starry Night by Van Gogh. It was painted by Vincent Van Gogh in June of 1889. It captures the view toward the east of the St. Remy de Provence. Though he painted the view from his room in the asylum 21 times, none of the paintings he created include the bars across his window. Though today it is arguably the most well-known painting, when writing to his brother, Van Gogh described it as a failure. The painting is full of dark blue hues and bursts of goldenrod. The village in Van Gogh's painting was added by the artist. For years, I saw this painting in a variety of ways and honestly thought it was a bit ridiculous. It seemed like a picture of just another village nestled into some mountains. It was nothing of the painting that caused me to say, that's my favorite piece of art in the world. That is, until I learned the story behind it. Vincent van Gogh, a genius who spoke five languages and wrote fluently in three of them, is known in the history books as a mentally insane artist who severed his own ear and later took his life. The fact that he wrestled with his internal and external realities is heartbreaking. He struggled with life, happiness, injustice, and also Christianity. Born into a lineage of Dutch Reformed pastors, he himself was trained to follow suit. After he was rejected to serve in vocational pastoral ministry by denominational leaders, he began working and living with the poor in the tradition of the Franciscans. His willingness to live in the worst conditions so he could love the forgotten ones, offended church authorities, and he was pronounced unfit for the dignity of the priesthood. Though not formally trained as a painter, he found art was a more effective medium than, than a pulpit was to communicate his deep feeling of compassion for the suffering and how he felt God's presence among them. For the majority of his life, he seemed to vacillate between religious devotion and religious rejection. During one of his seasons of religious devotion, he even sought to become a missionary while announcing later in life that the God of the clergyman, he is for me as dead as a doornail. Later, he called himself no friend of present day Christianity. His struggle was less with the teachings of Jesus and much more with the corrupt institutional church of his day. Studying Van Gogh's writings and paintings reveals how a soul can struggle to bring what one knows to be true about God together with one's life experiences. It was during a time of religious devotion as mental illness became increasingly real to him that his most celebrated war work, known as Starry Night, emerged. It's a visible, uh, sorry, it's a visual parable. The scene is of a small village or hamlet underneath the sky filled with turmoil. Deep indigo represents the infiniteness of God's presence and streams and bursts of yellow symbolize sacred love. They are undeniably strong in the artist's work. The yellow stars in the sky illuminate the homes in the small village. In his commencement address at Biola University in May of 2012, artist Makoto Fujimura explained, The cypress tree and the church are two forms that connect heaven and earth. For the artists, heaven and earth share the same reality. The buildings and the imagery, sorry, the buildings in the imaginary town under the stars near St. Remy all emanate the same light, all but one, the church. Piers the artist did not see a true representation of God in the religious system of his day. The church building he painted resembles those in his native Holland, not France. He said, when I have a terrible need of, shall I say the word, religion, then I go out and paint the stars. When it came to his experiences with religion, whether it is because he didn't fit a specific mold the church of his day was looking for, or perhaps because he struggled to know who he truly was in Christ, 
Van Gogh seemed to hit a brick wall. His experience reveals that those who have been wounded in the name of religion and church often struggle to find God there. For us all, Van Gogh serves as a reminder that there is no reason why we should allow those wounds to distract us from our pursuit of God. Here's the, sto here's the moral of that story. Van Gogh craved for a, a, a relationship with Jesus. As he pursued it through uh, so-called full-time ministry, he was rejected because he didn't follow all the rules. And so religion itself insulated him from accessing an intimacy with God. That was his experience. And so he turned to painting to try to express himself and try to find God, as it were. But he was a tortured soul. The church at Ephesus has a problem, and Jesus knows it. You've plunged into all this, these good works, which are good things in and of themselves. But if you're not careful, you will substitute that for the true intimacy with God, which God desires. Now, we're going to find this in the seventh of these churches, the church at Laodicea, where Jesus desires to come and sup, knocks at the door, and wants to have a meal with them. And they must come and open the door. You and I need to make the same decision. We can't just bury ourselves in good church work and charitable donations and deeds and, and, and works of service. As good as those things are, this will not make up for an intimate fellowship and pursuit of God himself. Boy, I don't know how hard time is going here, but I'm going to read a few verses from the book of Song of Solomon, which is a book that's written um, about Solomon's pursuit of his bride. It typifies the relationship between Jesus and the believer. Uh, look at verse chapter one, verses two to four. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. This is the woman talking about her prospective bridegroom. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Look how the intimacy there. For your love is better than wine. Because of the fragrance of your good ointments, your name is ointment poured forth. Therefore, the virgins love you. Draw me away. Wow, that's passionate. You almost feel like you're going to blush reading these woman's notes about her, her, her description of her, her bridegroom. Um, but he's also, uh, you know, he's described here in chapter 2, uh, verse 2, like a lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. Uh, like an apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down in his shade with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. That's There's an intimacy. This is a very highly sexual book, uh, the Song of Solomon. Uh, we're reading in English. Boy, if we had it in Hebrew, it'd be a different story. Let's pick it up there in uh, chapter 3. She's, she's dreaming. By night, here's the woman. She says, by night on my bed, I sought the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. I will now arise and go about the city. In the streets and in the squares, I will seek the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. The watchmen who go about the city found me. I said, have you seen the one I love? Scarcely had I passed by them when I found the one I love. I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him to the house of my mother and into the chamber of her who concealed me. Do you see how she's chasing after him? She got up. She's in bed at night. She says, oh, I miss my loved one. I'm going to go. I'm going to get up and, and go search for him. So she searches for the city. She can't find him. She sees the watch. Maybe seen him. Now we haven't seen him, but she, she's undeterred. I'm not going back home until I've found him. And sure enough, she finds him. When she does, she says, I'm not letting him go. Does that describe your relationship with Jesus? Because if it doesn't, God's wanting you to get to that point again. We want to have a passionate pursuit of God. Let's go over there to Psalm 63. David said something. He was in the wilderness of Judea, dry and dusty. He was on the run from Saul. He was discouraged, but he was thirsty for God. He was thirsty physically too. It was hot and dry, arid climate there. And he was longing for water, but he was longing more for the water for his soul. 63 verse 1, Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. The word early in Hebrew can also be translated earnestly. Early or earnestly will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and weary land where there's no water. Later in verse 8 of Psalm 63, he says, My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds. My soul follows close behind you. Um, another version says, My soul clings to you. That's someone who's pursuing God. 
Jesus said the Ephesus church left their first love. They're doing the exact opposite of what they should be doing. They should be turning and rushing towards him. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, if I have the uh, tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a clanging gong and a, and a symbol. He goes, if I gave all my, you know, my body be burned and gave all my, my, my goods to the poor, but I didn't have love, it would profit me nothing, Paul said. Paul recognized you've got to have love or else all your good works don't amount to anything either. Okay, we've got to wrap this up. So if there's, if it's true that the love that God has for us, so God is pursuing us too, by the way, but he's not going to, he's not going to force our hand. He, he wants to know that you and I want it. He wants to be chased. It's like that girl in the playground at school and she's kind of got a crush on the boy. And so she acts like she's trying to get away from him and she's hoping he's going to chase her, but she's secretly hoping he's going to catch her. And that's kind of how God is. God's saying, I want you to chase after me. I, how bad do you want me? How, how much do you really love me? Would you forsake all others for me? Sometimes that's what we say in, we hear in vows, forsaking all others. We choose this person that we're making vows to, right? Are we willing to forsake all others and all other things for God? You know, in Philippians 2, verse 3 and 4, Paul talks about our love for others. I'll start with that one. Because it's really good. It's a good um, expression of our of God's love in us that's working through us. He says this. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. Now you have to have your head screwed on right, and you have to be hungering for God in order to put others first like that, okay? The, the other verse I want to give you is what Peter said in his sermon in Acts 3, verse 19. He's preaching to a crowd there, and there's conviction there about the, the crucifixion of Jesus. He says this, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. I like the New American Standard because it uses three R's. Repent and return, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Okay, back to our passage there. He actually said that. It's not too late you left your first love. You shouldn't have in the first place. And now you're in this place where you're caught up with all this religion, all these works. Look at what good things I'm doing. Surely God will look on me with satisfaction for all the good things I'm doing. And it's not that God thinks those works aren't good. He's just saying that's not, that's not the most important thing. And if you don't have the main thing, all the other stuff doesn't count too. Because look what he said. You've left your first love. Verse 5, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. When did I stop chasing God? When was I stopped? Did I stop thirsting and hungering for righteousness? When did I stop pursuing him? I need to get back to that place. He says, remember, therefore, where you have fallen. Repent. Repent means change your mind. When you change your mind, you change your action. You can't change your action if you haven't changed your mind first. It's kind of like you're doing this. No, I'm not doing that. I'm going back. I'm doing this instead. He says, remember where you've fallen. Repent, change your mind, turn around and go back and do the first works. And he says, because if you don't, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now, there's a lot more in this chapter, but I want to focus on that today. There's a reward when we get back to loving Christ first and intimately and hungering for his presence and being like Mary who sat at the feet of Jesus. There's a reward for that. He says in verse 7, I will give to the one who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. That tree has not been mentioned since Genesis, when that was tree was in the center of the garden, and Adam and Eve had access to that before they sinned. But when they wanted to do things on their own, they priced themselves out of the market, and they were prevented from enjoying the fruit of that tree. But the work of Jesus on the cross, the finished work of Jesus on the cross, in dying for our sins has made access again to the tree of life. We need this, my friend. We can't just keep going on, stumbling about, doing good works, and as good as they are, we need to have a passionate pursuit of Christ. Let me pray for you. 
Father, we want, in the words of this author, we want our relationship to be a sacred chase. We want to return to first love. We want to remember where we fell off. We don't want to just keep trying to pile on good works and things to try to make up for it. That's not going to work. That's not what's pleasing to you. What's pleasing to you, Lord, is that we put you first and we hunger and thirst for you. That we desire more of you, your presence to be filling our life. Oh God, I pray for each one at the sound of my voice today. That you would refresh us. You would renew us. You would, as we repent of our, our worldliness and we repent of our dead works and, and, and leaving our first love. We repent of that and we pledge, Lord, we are moving back to you. We are desiring to have this intimate walk with you. We are wanting to chase after you again. Oh, God, would you bring times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord, as Peter said in Acts 3.19. Lord, bring this on us as we continue to study this book and learn these other lessons from these other churches. Father, would you bring us back to first love? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Boy, read that chapter over a couple more times. That, that, Revelation 2 verses 1 to 7 over a couple more times. Feed on that. Pray on that. We'll see you next week. Take care.